Welcome to another episode of Eric White Whiskey Studies. This is a special episode. Going to have a special guest on to talk about the bourbon track for the Council of Whiskey Masters. As most of you know, I've been studying the Scotch track, but I've been getting questions about the bourbon track, which I can't answer. So, uh, my guest, we met up in Scotland in April 2024, and I thought, you know what? I need to bring someone on who really knows the bourbon track and share his experience and his journey in studying for the Council of Whiskey Masters. So let me introduce my guest. This is Kevin Malta, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so Malta is an island. Uh, I think it's independent now, and it used to belong to Italy, right? Do you know? I'm not sure if it's belonged to Italy at one point, but it's off the coast of Italy, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I think it belonged to Italy at one time, and now it's... Uh, independent, and I think they still speak Italian there. I remember that from my actually from my wine from the from the wine days. So as we're talking about the bourbon track for the Council of Whiskey Masters, this is a bottle I've been sitting on for a while. It's Elijah Craig Private Barrel. Sorry, you're not going to find it anywhere. Uh, it's a private select picked up from a bourbon and wine shop in uh, Roseville, California, near Sacramento. Where I used to live. And it's bottled at 136 proof. I'm a big fan of uh, Elijah Craig. So, finally breaking this one open. All right. So, first, probably a wee dram. Um, first, do, do they call them drams in the bourbon world? Sometimes. Some folks use the word dram. Okay. Uh -huh. So, I'm semi bourbon ignorant. There's a lot of stuff I know, a lot of stuff I don't know. So, this would be educational for both of us. Sometimes I do. Yeah, some folks do. You know, a lot of people who also drink scotch have brought that kind of sure. nomenclature over. Sure. So, so First of all, mo most people know my story. I started off in wine and then transitioned over into whiskey. How did you get into whiskey and why specifically did you get into bourbon? It's a great question. So a long time ago, well not so long ago, my, my girlfriend actually, we went down to Mexico City to visit her, her brother. And down there they didn't have a lot of bourbon available to them. And so they asked us to mule, mule a few bottles of Booker's. Oh, okay. And so we brought a couple bottles of Booker's. I had never had Booker's before in my life. We get there, you know, because we like brought it for them. They cracked it for us. And this is the first time I've had just straight barrel proof bourbon. Wow. Okay. And it just, something when I had that first sip, my, it just, just lit up. I was like, wow, this tastes amazing. Right, right, you right. Caramels, vanillas, you know, not used to, you know, the Jack Daniels that we used to have back in college and everything. It was just a very eye-opening experience. Right, right, right. So I guess it's like a select cast at a particular part of the Rick House. Uh, that that this really fits the profile they want, and so they bottled those, right? Yeah, it's, it's on the sixth floor. Typically, they take barrels from the sixth floor, and it's a small batch release. So right. they, they blend and marry a few barrels together, right. and every they do four a year now. They used to have different variations on the number they release per year, but now it's very standardized to four a year. So how long, how long ago was that, you say? That was back in, um, gosh, I think 2021. Oh, okay. Wow. So fairly so recent. Fairly okay. recent. Yeah. Recent. Okay. And then I just dove right down that rabbit hole very quickly. Right. Into bourbons. So did you have any, like previously, did you drink, like some people started drinking beers or something like that, or just uh, a casual drinker or cocktails or anything like that, or this is like your real first time getting into uh, spirits? I mean, I enjoyed beer time to time, a good IPA here and there, but I wasn't really ever like, really like intellectually curious about alcohol or spirits. And it's just bourbon just kind of took that just in the, just like something in my brain just like went off and says, I need to learn more about this. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, understand like, why do I taste these things in this, in this glass that I couldn't, you know, identify, you know, before when I was drinking alcohol and spirits. Right. And so I just started, just started opening up and I was starting to ask these questions. And those questions led to curiosity. Did you have a particular favorite at the beginning? Any particular distilleries you were big fans of? So where did your, your bourbon journey sort of uh, go from there? I took a very standard track into the bourbon journey. So after trying Booker's, I, I tried a variety of those, which were amazing. I tried a, a lot of different batches. And then I started diving into the Sazerac products. Okay. So as a lot of bourbon drink, early bourbon drinkers do, you know, they, they try to go after, um, you know, Buffalo Trace, Eagle Rare. They go for Weller. They go for Stag Juniors, all of those. And then, you know, the elusive BTAC at the time, you know, couldn't get my hands on it, but right. tried it at a bar a few times. But... That's really where I, I started. It wasn't until I started branching out doing bottle shares with a lot of other people did I get to see what else was possible, what else, like, there was good bourbon out there. Okay. 
And so that kind of started opening my eyes to see that, you know, there are a lot of different characteristics and all these distilleries produce a very different spirit. And when you can kind of break that down, it really brings you back to trying to ask those questions of what makes their spirit what it is. Right. So, for example, uh, Elijah Craig, which is Heaven Hill, a Heaven Hill, yes. Heaven Hill product, and I, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, in my personal opinion, my uh, limited exploration of bourbons, tends to be, I think, high quality price ratio bourbons. They're not insane, like some of the Pappies and all that. They're, you know, some for thousands of dollars. Still fine. And they have, what, four releases a year? If three, I recall, three releases. Three releases a year. Yeah. They still tend to be generally affordable, typically, at least in my neighborhood. I know price is different in the country. Under to 100, 100 bucks. And, but there's variations uh, that come out like quarterly or? or yeah, so they have, um, they have the A, B, and C release. Right. And so the A release aligns with January. Okay. B is May. And then C is September. Okay. So I think I have a C bottling down here. So, and now sometimes if you watch the bourbon channels out there, you know, they'll say, well, this one's kind of okay. This one's really, really, really good. And the ABVs can kind of come up down. Right. And then every once in a while, there'll be something that's more spectacular that everybody jumps on and everybody kind of raves about and chases on. But even then, even that, it seems to me, in my observation of watching bourbon channels, is even then, if they don't become insanely difficult to get. You can still get them. And there's going to be another release, you know, another three releases, releases. There's never been anything like totally sucked. Mm -hmm. You know, they still I, I, I really high quality to it. So uh, continue on in your bourbon journey, but a little bit. Tell me, what do you think about this one? Let's break it apart. Well, first thing that jumps out is the 136 proof. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, the, the nose hairs are uh, tinging a little bit. You know, Elijah Craig is just quintessential bourbon. You know, it's, you get all of those characteristic caramels, vanillas, brown sugars, and there's there's a good amount of age on it too. You know, eight right. years. It's it's not the oldest Elijah Craig right. expression, but you do get that oak, and so it really comes through, and it's it's very very nice. It's a bit nutty too. I yeah, like putting on the back end. It's hot. It's hot. It's tingly. It's warming. It gives now, you that good Kentucky hug, you know. You're right. So we had a little bit, just a little bit uh, that we're sipping on. Um, before we, we started recording, I, I have a, as a, a warm-up uh, dram, and we were talking about perception of the ABV levels, and I was talking about the mouthfeel of it. Now, for those who don't know, I just recovered from several months of sinus infections and pneumonia, and I had to go through a series of antibiotics and, and all that. I haven't talked a lot about that, but when you take a break from whiskey and then come back, even something as low as 40 ABV can seem kind of high. So one of the things I, and I mentioned off camera is sometimes, and it seems more a case with bourbons due to being a grain spirit rather than a malt. I find you could have something that's actually fairly high ABV, but it's not like necessarily, I find heavy weighty uh, a whiskey, that it's still, it can be light and delicate and we talked about uh, the Joseph Bagnus, like the uh, cigar uh, blends, and yet be still be high ABV. So I get the ABV on this one based on, yeah, there's the tingle, there's the heat. You don't have to put your nose too deep to start getting some out of it. And yet, on the palate, I'm finding it's still quite approachable and silky, and, it, and it's not killing me. I'm not wincing and cringing from it. Yeah, bur bourbon really carries that high proof pretty well. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for those who don't know, in the Council Whiskey Masters, the track is you either do a bourbon track or a scotch track, and then there is just the whiskey track, in which you need to have a knowledge of the world of whiskeys. So you can come to that level from either coming from the bourbon side or the scotch side. And then there's the next level, which is actually going to include blind tasting, oral exams, and written exams. So I did the Scotch track. You did the bourbon track. Yes. So the Scotch track, you do the levels one and two online. You have the first is, well, from the Scotch world, 
There's a, a book, a downloadable PDF book from uh, by Charlie McLean that you read. You then have a multiple choice question. The level two is you have textbooks you need to read and the, the exams could be a, a more challenging. From level two to level three, it's not equally spaced in terms of difficulty. It's a huge jump. It's a huge jump. It's essay, exam, essay questions for the Scotch side, 30 minutes, and I heard they're gonna be increasing the time on that. 30, eight whiskeys in 30 minutes, and a, an, oral exam, an oral exam in front of a panel uh, or a committee. Um, unfortunately, when I was there in Scotland, um, I had the allergies going on. I didn't even recognize what it was when I had it over there. <coughs> it wasn't until I got back to the U.S. I got diagnosed with the sinus infection and all that nonsense. But anyway, uh, but then even then, there is the technical side of be able to do this, typing really, 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 really fast and fit it into the grid and come to a quick conclusion, which is, that's a skill set on its own. It's one thing to... We're going to sit here and we're going to talk the next half hour about this whiskey or whatever and come to say we're doing this blind and come to the conclusion as to what it is, you know, after half an hour versus you're talking three minutes, three and, and some for in 30 minutes. I mean, that's that's insane. So, 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 but the model is following, for those who don't know, I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Mass Sommeliers, Debbie said studies and so forth. There's a mirroring between the Council of Whiskey Masters and with the Quarter Master Small A's. It's not exact same, it's not a cut and paste, but there's similarities. With the WC Diploma in two hours, 11 wines, unless the program has changed. With the advanced level uh, in the Quarter Master Small A's and, and the Master Small A's, you have, uh, and the Master level in the Quarter Master Small A's, it's six wines, and you have about three minutes each. So, and, and again, in front of a little little panel, like maybe three or four master sommeliers. So this is very parallel, very parallel to that. So it's not, if you pass level two and you think, oh, well, going from one to two wasn't that bad, going to level three won't be that, that difficult. No, 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 it's a whole nother, it's, this is separating junior varsity from the pros. Really, really, really. Is that your sort of your perception from the bourbon side as well? Yes, it was an incredibly large step up comparatively. So um, we have three books here. Now there is a, a long list of books. Some there's some overlap between the books required for the Scots side and the bourbon side. We have three books here. Uh, let's talk about these real quick. Sure thing. First up we have here, as you can see here, I've uh, loved this book a lot. There's a lot of um, notes here. This one here is Bourbon by Clay Rison. So what's really nice about this book, it has beautiful photography. You can see like all these different photos about Kentucky and the distilleries that they're showcasing in here. It, it covers a little bit of history in the beginning, a little bit of production methods, and then it goes on to talk about specific distilleries and breaking down some of their different production techniques that differ between different okay. distilleries. And they have a huge section on craft whiskey, okay. which was really, really nice to read as well. So there are two books for the on Scott's side, one by Dave Broom, and Charlie McLean. Mm -hmm. It sounds very similar to those books as well. Really, really good books for learning, but could also be a coffee table book because it's got the nice photography exactly. and, and all that as well. This one would definitely fit yeah, in that category. Good. Yeah. So let's talk about these other two books and then we'll get on more with your journey. What's this other book? Um, this other book here um, is Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey, which is by Michael Veach. This one was, it's not very long, it's like 120 pages or so, but it is very dense with history. It is. It goes from the beginning of the formation of the U.S. and then how whiskey came, to, bourbon whiskey became to be, and it covers all the way up to the, the present day, which was roughly about 2000 when this was released. And it doesn't come with sticky notes. He added those. Yes, <laughs> I have the little, little colorful peacock that is here. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. So if I don't use sticky notes so much unless I know it. I'm going to need it later on to put in the notes or something like that. But I do a lot of writing and mm -hmm. underlining and highlighting. And sometimes I'll know where it is because in my head, I have a picture in my head. Oh yeah, I, I, I like to put a little asterisk or star next or something like that. So, and a lot of uh, dog-eared uh, corners, you know, on the page. And not. So what made you decide, you know what, I want to go further in my study of bourbon than, I don't know, what you can find online or visit a distillery. I actually want to get some sort of certification, spend the time to an actual 
formal study. What made you want to take that next leap, leap in, in, in studying whiskey or learn about uh, bourbon? That's a great question. For me, it was, it was a little bit that whiskey has always been just a very, just been able to tickle this curiosity that I have. And I love it and been able to pursue it intellectually in this format was great. Why I wanted to get into it was that, you know, I've, I've uh, done a various educational pursuits. I have two bachelor's degrees, I have a master's degree. And from there, I've, I would just, you know, knew how to be a student. And right. so I, f I really appreciated the format of trying to break this down, break whiskey down and trying to take it from the, the angle of, I want to learn this in, stru in a structured program, yeah. which really would be helpful in order to be able to, to tease apart all the, the possible directions you can go. Additionally, it creates a layer of accountability. Doing something like this, knowing oh, yeah. you to show up to an exam at some point, it you sit down, you do the work. And there's a date. There's a there's a clock ticking. There's a calendar rolling. Yes. And on a particular date, you better get get together. So it keeps you from procrastinating. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. So you have a final exam where you got to turn the term paper. You know, that's like back when you're in college. So I, I, I something I find in common is you got to find people just by nature, by the character of the background. Who get into this have a more formal academic background and not necessarily working in the industry there's a lot of people you find medical doctors and pilots and uh, all kinds of different fields who just got into whiskey and they want to take the same studies academic approach to things that they did in their specialty in their professional field and then get into uh, the whiskey side as well and of course there's a lot of people in the industry as well uh, that this is part of their career and this is a boost to their career. But whether you're working in the actual Scotch whiskey industry or bourbon industry or you're working in retail, distribution, or whatever else, it's also for people just like, like I just want to go full on nerd and, 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 and set us to this particular topic. I think that was a commonality between everyone that we met on the trip is that everyone was just a nerd about whiskey, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. which was yeah, just yeah. so refreshing to find a yeah. group of like-minded people just yeah. wanted to get together, right. talk about whiskey, be tested on whiskey. Right, right. So yeah, that, was, yeah. that was great. Particularly the bald-headed nerds. <laughs> I won't mention any names. Cigar! <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> he's great. Nerd! Okay, he was a, he's a master. He's now a master of whiskey. One of these days I'll, I, I'll have him on again. So, was there anything, like, what's your experience with other whiskeys and this, like, my first exploration was actually in bourbon. I went to Kentucky uh, probably within a year of getting into whiskey, visited six distilleries, but there was something about Scott that just sort of grabbed me. So, have you explored that much with other whiskeys and just found bourbon was what you preferred or... And people have different reasons why they focus in on bourbon. Is there a particular reason why you focus on bourbon? For me, with bourbon, it was just, it's where I started, right? So it's, I think I developed the flavor profile and the affinity for it early on. Um, I do like scotch. I'm actually getting more into Japanese and Irish. Okay. I'm looking to sit for the next year's exam as well for the oh. Master of Whiskey. Oh, so okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to get a lot more familiar than well, I am right now. Okay. So. Okay. Wow. So... But the so the, the advantage is, I mean, this is our home field, the United right. States. Um, and depending on what state you're living in, availability can be a bit challenging. We're both Californian residents. California is, I think, pretty good in terms of availability and ability to have stuff shipped in mm -hmm. and out. There are some states and, and places where having stuff shipped in is a challenge. And generally speaking, prices are, I think, a little bit more fair than we're not a controlled state. It's controlled states tend to have better prices, but more challenging availability. So they got to get friends or something like that to bring stuff in. So there's that sort of advantage there is. This is our home spirit, you know, in the United States versus her name slips my mind. She's down there in Australia. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Carmen. Carmen, Carmen. Yes. Sorry, Carmen. Sorry, Carmen. Down in Australia. And then one of the things I would like to ask her is, What's the, because she passed the Master of Bourbon exam. She did, yes. And I'm kind of curious, what is the availability of bourbon in, in order to study down there in Australia? See, the challenge is, is, if you can't get it, how are you supposed to know it and study for it for an exam? We had a gentleman who was studying for the Master of Scotch exam, and he's not from the United States or European country, and he straight up says he can't get um, Springbank. And I'm like, holy cow, how are you supposed to prepare for an exam if you can't even get it? A Bladnock got added to the list this last year, which is a Lowland distillery. 
I, I was able to visit and but we can get local bottles here but it doesn't have the distribution that other scotches it's sort of an up-and-coming uh dis distillery great whiskeys by the way so in terms of the list of bourbon distilleries are nearly how many do they have on the list uh, for the master of bourbon uh, program they had 24 24 okay and they can change one or two distilleries can change every year mm -hmm. so this next year in 2025 they've added johnny walker which is a blend of scotch it'll be the first time they have actually have a, a blend of scotch on it which is i think is a good idea because if you're, if you're a master of scotch and not a master of single malt i think it's good to bring on something more than a, a single malt you know to, to broaden a little bit did you find the, the one I had most curious about is just sometimes for Scotch people we go oh, bourbons all seem the same. Obviously, one of the big differences in bourbons is what's the mash bill? Is it a weeder? You know, mostly wheat. How much rye is in there? How much malt is in there? Cast, red cows, and so forth. I'm really curious. So in Scotch whiskey, peated or non-peated, sherry cask, bourbon cask. And then you could take bourbon cask and sherry cask and dial it in. So you have a range of influence mm -hmm. between uh, bourbon and sherry. Fermentations, short fermentation, a little nuttier, longer fermentation, fruitier. So in scotch, it seems in one sense easier because those distinctives are so clear. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, uh, an Isla peated is very different than a sherry cask from Space Side. So the, the differences are clearer. And so it seemed to be, in some sense, it would be easier on a blind taste exam as long as you're not, you don't have a freaking pneumonia. Uh, so, but, so from a bourbon side, and yet there's bourbon channels that I've watched that blow my mind, their ability to identify a bourbon, and they recognize where it's coming from based on a profile. Talk to me a little bit about that. I'm a little curious as how challenging is and what are they kind of doing in terms of the profile of representation in the blind tasting. In other words, for the Scotch side, they're gonna they're not gonna be all Isla, they're not gonna be all Highland, they're not gonna be all space side, they're not gonna be all sherry. You're gonna have variations. You're gonna have some cash strength, you're gonna have some 40 ABV, you're gonna have some bourbon cast, you're gonna have some sherry cast, and you're gonna have some that are mixed between the two, and you're gonna maybe have a couple of different peated ones, some that are intensely peated and some that are lightly peated. So there's a variation in the profile of what you're being tested on. What is that like on the bourbon side? It's a great question. So for starters, I've always identified as someone who needs to put sriracha on my food. I haven't always said like, I have a phenomenal palate in any way. And so for me, diving into this, it was a very learned skill. Um, and so that's just, for anyone that's out there who's like, I don't know if I have the ability to do this, it's trainable. And so that's, that's for starters. So when it came to the bourbon, what you really are playing, the playing field with bourbon is that, like you were saying, is that mash bill. There are, there are ways to identify, you know, whether or not they're using rye or wheat as um, the flavoring grain in, in, the, in the bourbon. Additionally, when, for the bourbon track, though it's called bourbon, they do also have rye whiskeys on there. Oh, okay. Which does give you a pretty, pretty good uh, variability, okay. which is nice. Okay. That's it. Okay. So that, and so here's the trick then. You get tripped up. Is this a high rye bourbon or is it a rye? Because technically, 51% rye and it's a rye, even if the other 49 is uh, corn. Now, obviously, I don't know of any bottles that are that close in the, in the breakup. So that would be, could be quite challenging that you could pull it off think it's a high rye bourbon when actually it's a rye or vice versa, right? One thing they do on the test, though, is they try to pick very distinguishing bottle like okay. they, they try to distinguish a lot between the bottles and so for example the rye they chose for us was bardstown bourbon company rye which is a 95.5 rye so that's 95 percent rye whiskey five percent malted barley that's that's a rye with a capital r oh, exactly yeah. and so they're not trying to find something that's barely legal okay. just above like 51 percent okay. so okay okay not to say they can't do that because it's definitely right. a testable bottle but they try right. to make it a little bit more obvious right. to see like when, they, when they're actually going to test you. Right. So you might say classic profile then. Yeah. So that's, so if you look at the Council of Whiskey Master website and look at the Court of Master Sommeliers website from say for the Americas, you'll see some very, there's some similarities there in terms of how they describe themselves. 
in the Court of Master Sommeliers, they're going to give you, try to give you classic vintages. So if you had a Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire from a really ripe vintage, real hot year, mm -hmm. it's not going to seem like it's from the Loire. It's going to seem more New World. So they're going to try to pick wines that are more classic and, 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 and vintages that are classic and profiles that are classic. And they're not going to give you, you know, a Pinot Noir from Idaho. So they do try to have classic profiles. So it sounds like they're doing the same thing with the bourbons. Yes. Here is a classic weeded bourbon. So just name for me, a few, say five maybe, a classic weeded bourbon, do you think? Um, well, Maker's Mark, right? There's there's a number of expressions for that. They have a toasted. They, they also have the cast strength version as well. And so there's there's very very right. there. You got your Weller. Right. Weller is a very common classic uh, weeder, which is on the on the test. Then you get Larceny. Heaven Hill has their own weeded okay. uh, whiskey. Which, that one's a very good one to select, and it's also on the exam. Okay. Um, Bardstown Bourbon Company also had a weeded whiskey. Um, they have their Bardstown Bourbon Company Black Label. Okay. And then Willet Pot Still. Oh, Willet Pot Still. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the, the one that actually looks like a pot still. Yes. Okay. Which I've got one up here, so I know that. And no, you cannot use that bottle to uh, turn into a bong later on when you empty <laughs> that. That is absolutely, you, you don't do that. All right. People turn that bottle into a lamp and do all kinds of it's a, it's a great bottle for that. <laughs> and and if, a bong, if, if you're in that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we do not recommend smoking any uh, illegal uh, substances. Or even if they're illegal, we don't, I don't recommend it. All right. So, so then, so, so the classic profiles then is something that's more weeded, mm -hmm. something that's maybe a high rye they could put on there, and then something that's just distinctly a rye. I would say that the, the, the the dimensions that you'd probably be looking for is they probably try to put one high rye on there. Right. A weeded whiskey. Something that's finished. And so Angel's Envy oh, is on there, so there's a right. port finish and a rye finish. Right. There's also the toasted finishings. You have Elijah Craig toasted. You have Maker's 46. So some of those kind of barrel okay. finishings. They also have a Woodford du double oaked, which showed up on the exam the prior, the okay. previous year. Um, so that's another thing, the dimension they look at. They, they put a rye on there. So okay. make sure that that's represented. So we've got an understanding of the profile of what is testable in terms of the bottles. Um, that it's not only bourbon, but actually they put the rye in there. Could be wheater, could be a high rye, uh, and different mash bills and so forth. Do they do anything from like different states? Obviously, everybody knows bourbon in Kentucky, but are they doing any other states or anything like that? Or does that come in any play there? Yes. So uh, they actually have two Tennessee whiskeys listed. There's Jack Daniels and there's George Dickel. Okay, right. Uh, there's a most recent addition this year, which is Garrison Brothers. Oh, Because cool. the test is going to be taking place at the Garrison Brothers Distillery. Right, so next year. It's really good just to, to prep people and to let them understand about the world of Texas whiskey right. through this expression. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of Texas whiskey. Been to maybe, I don't know, 13 or so distilleries down there. I've had Dan Garrison on here and been to the distillery. Um, Texas has its own unique profile. It, what's kind of cool is... You know, in the Scotch world, there's Isla, and then there's Speyside, and there's Highlands, regionality. And so bourbon more, uh, in my perception, with Texas growing, and now those things which used to only be available in Texas are now getting out into the market. There is a sense of regionality with, with Texas. Um, so where do you see that going? I mean, do you see more on the radar? Am I talk on it? Or, or is, is, are those bottles? Is only Garrison Brothers come on to the profile? Or what's, what's going on with that? I can't speak to the, the exam format itself and how they're changing it based on regionality, but uh, you know, seeing Garrison Brothers on there, that is really indicating like, hey, the council's looking at other whiskey regions to say this is we, we recognize this as something right. we should test. Right. Um, but if you look at other brands and profiles like um, Frey Ranch near us, Fallon, right. Nevada, clearly some regionality there with the with the right. land, with the, the whole grain to glass concept as well as the fact that they have such hot climates in right. Nevada too. But that kind of makes it challenging because we mentioned, talked about earlier, it's not just about what is there and representative, but what's available. Right. And so if you're going to choose a bourbon from um, Texas, what is widely available? And there's Iron Root Republic, which are great, but do they have the distribution, significant enough distribution to make it fair to put it on an exam? And the fact that there is such popularity is it like putting Pappy on the exam in terms of scarcity? There's still Austin is another great uh, Texas bourbon, but again, is it getting outside of Texas? 
So in one sense, and a lot of distilleries in Texas are micro distilleries, family run and all that, which is cool. But if you're gonna put it on an exam, it needs to be a little bit more global. Balcones, but they're doing single malts. I think they have at least, I know they have a rye, I think they have a bourbon. They do. So they could throw that in there. But is their bourbon global? They got bought up a Diageo, and so the single malts are getting global. They are getting a little bit more available, let's say in the UK, but still, in terms of their bourbon, is it really there to where they could throw it into the into the lineup? Probably not, but Garrison Brother definitely is. And Dan Garrison, a very energetic guy, very out there, great promoter of, of, of his brand, brand. His whiskey is very much, his bourbon is very much reflective of, of the personality and the enthusiasm that, that Dan has in, in, for bourbon and, and making distinctively Texas style uh, bourbons. So we went over the books a little bit. We've talked about the blind tasting. What about the oral exams? And this, for, well, before we talk about the oral exam, let's open up another bottle. we got something else in there we want to share. Um, I know we are just talking a little bit about regionality. And so this whiskey here that I brought with me, this is one that I really enjoyed over the last year. Here's a glass for you as well. Thank you, sir. Um, so this one is a Jim Beam product. It's called Hardens Creek. They did three products in this release. There's a Claremont, a Frankfurt, and a Boston, all of which are representing different warehousing okay. facilities for Jim Beam. And so the concept here is they took the same whiskey, but aged at different rickhouses oh. across Kentucky. Oh, oh, wow, that's cool. So you, you kind of see, if you get the lineup in the series, you can see the differences in those regionalities, even in these like micro regions. <clears throat> see, that's nerdy. That's nerdy, That's nerdy yes. because, <laughs> because the question is, okay, what does the different stills do? What do different tech casts do? What do different rickhouses do? Um, and wanting to understand that. Well, here's the experiment. Or, and you could buy one of each and do a side by side and go, oh yeah, I can definitely see the difference. So let's pour ourselves a little bit. It's a beautiful bottle as well. Oh, cool. Let's see here, a little leather strap. Here, we can move this off to the side. So, there we go. There we go. Nice, cool. All right, I'll let you pour, uh, pour me a, a little bit. It's a nice heavy weighted topper. Uh, it's always, always classy. And what's the proof or ABV on this? It is 110 proof, 55 ABV. Okay. So we're going down a little bit from the okay. <laughs> pleasure crack here. The oral exams. Now, if you're a whiskey tuber, you're used to being in front of a camera, you're used to talking off the top of your head. If you do live streams, you're used to an answering questions. You know, it's a little awkward to talk to a camera and there's nobody actually there. Um, so you used to be more uh, in public speaking, be able to think off the top of your head. So I'd imagine some people who may be, maybe more, it's the books and at home on their own, but this be in front of a committee, uh, you know, a group of professionals can be really, really challenging. And at my age, I have these moments like the little dial is spinning and I know that, and it's like, uh, uh, you know, there's that, oh, oh, I know this one. And then if you stop thinking about it, it'll click in your head. But in the meantime, you're like, oh crap, I can't remember this. So thankfully, I was able to pull enough out. Sometimes it's something I've talked about, even done videos on, and yet for some, I'm drawn a blank at that particular, and, that, and it gets worse as I get older. So, but I'm used to answering questions. So how about for you in terms of like the oral exam? How, how did you find that? Well, I just say for starters, like it's just, exam pressure it's it's, it's nerve-wracking right so there's always that kind of going on in the background but our panel of judges were really really encouraging and they started right. off with some jokes and just kind of lighten the mood right. a little bit and so we all get to loosen up a bit the questions were from a variety of different areas it was we had history we had production we had quotes it was just there's a lot of different pieces that right. people were pulling from it was interesting but if you do the reading they're pulling directly from all that material. So it's, right. it shouldn't be, you, you can be able to recall this stuff. Right. So if I could show you uh, at least some of my, I have stacks and stacks of cards, of mem memory cards. Mm -hmm. So did you do the same thing with the flashcards and all that? Yeah, I did, I did some flashcards. I also, you saw the, the books. How they yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got all the feathers sticking out of there. I, I compiled those into like a document and just okay. like did multiple exercises of organizing them by different kind of Okay. Like topic, right. so like timeline history versus region-based history stuff okay. like that. 
Right. And that's actually one of the main reasons that, that I even do my channel mm. is if the viewers enjoy it and learn from it, that's great. What's more important is I remember stuff. <laughs> and sometimes I actually use my videos to uh, as flashcards. I can go back over just the note part uh, to, to, rem to remind myself. So the other thing, about it, not only is to try to think, you know, to remember stuff, not knowing what they're going to ask, but they want you to dress nice. Yes. So, so, uh, you know, you're wearing a suit and I, fat people with fat necks and beards, I, I don't, I don't like wearing a suit, but you got to wear a suit. So wear a suit. And next year is going to be in Texas in April. Uh, hopefully it'll be a still somewhat cool because that's, I think that's Hyde, Texas, or Garrison Brothers at. That's one of the hottest regions of Texas and the worst allergies. Uh, so if you've got allergy problems, you might want to get a navage or some other stuff ahead of time before we go there if you're taking exams. So how did you feel you did, do you think, on... So, by the way, there is a video on the 2024 exams, and you're in that video. And so if you haven't seen that, I'll put a link to that down below. What do you think, was, what was your greatest strength And between the... the we, so there was, I, don't know, I can't remember how many, like 20 or so essay questions that could have been on there, and you, you type those up. And then there's obviously the oral exam in front of, front of uh, committee members and then the blind tasting. Out of those three, what did you find the most challenging? I found the most challenging to be the blind tasting. Oh, yeah. But it's the one I spent the most time preparing for, and I think that's the one that I did the best Right. showing up that day. So. I think that's probably common. I mean, in the Court of Master Sommeliers, that's, for most people, that's the most challenging. However... I, I know people who they, they worked in wine distribution mm -hmm. and so they didn't work the floor in a restaurant. So for them, it was actually the floor exams, the service exams are more difficult where they're actually, I mean, just nailing blind tasting. And then there's, you have to be an encyclopedia of wine in order to pass the exams. So you have these parameters of these books, but the question always comes up and there's no way to answer this to some extent. So what do I need to know from these books? in order to pass the exam. Well, you need to know the books. <laughs> is it dates? Is it names? Is it places? Is it production styles? Is it producers? Is it, it yes. All the above. Yes, all the above. If it's in the book, if it's in the book, it could be an exam. Now, if you stick to just the required reading, you may be handicapping yourself. There are other recommended resources. I highly recommend any, particularly, what is the latest happenings in the whiskey world? So online whiskey journals, uh, may, you know, may, maybe some of the more popular ones like the Whiskey Enthusiast or Whiskey Advocate, because sometimes they're the, the latest happenings that are going on. Hey, watch a few whiskey tuber channels. That's not gonna. That's not gonna hurt. So, was there anything I'd say outside of the books you think you found particularly helpful? You got into that you think of? I think it's just just immersing yourself in the world of like whiskey or bourbon in my case, that is really helpful. Just like you're able to talk the talk, understand ex like what the, what the industry cares about at a given point in time. Right. And so what I ended up finding pretty useful was our, we had a little study group. That was, I highly recommend forming study groups if you end up doing it. Uh, we, we, we talked a lot about some theoretical questions like what is the impact of climate change on climate change on the bourbon industry? Or what? what is the, the latest discourse about the black fungus, black mold? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Other things that we, we got into is, is Jack Daniels, a bourbon. Jack Daniels is a bourbon. Uh, Jack Daniels is a Tennessee whiskey. It's not a bourbon. Jack Daniels meets the legal definition of a bourbon. In fact, it's 80% corn, 12% malted barley, 8% rye, aged in new oak, and has no added colors or flavoring. Duh, Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. Jack Daniels federal labeling is classified as a bourbon. Dude, Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. Jack Daniels is listed as a bourbon under NAFTA. Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. Jack Daniels is a Tennessee whiskey bourbon that undergoes Lincoln County processing, but not all Tennessee whiskeys undergo Lincoln County processing, charcoal filtering, so not all Tennessee whiskeys even meet the description of Jack Daniels. For more whiskey content, like and subscribe. Oh. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a fight ensued. There were three people taken to the hospital.
you can argue it both ways. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's a really, really interesting question. topic. Yeah. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about this bourbon. What did you say the AB uh, was, was it? Forty six ABV. This so you guys are used to the proof thing. I'm used to ABV, I'm, and then I've got to convert it when you say proof. Uh, fifty five percent ABV. Okay, fifty five. Okay, yeah. I was gonna say it does have a little bit of a tingle there, a little bit of a bite. Oh, and there is a pretty big range on the exam as well. Yeah, they, they do test some some uh, cast strength stuff. Okay, so you should you should be able to detect this is a forty or forty three. Say scotch forty or forty three. This is something. So there's classic numbers forty. Which is the bare minimum. Yeah. 40, 43, 46. You, you know, you have those 46.7s and those kind of nonsense stuff. And then something that's a little bit more cash strength, 55 plus. Um, and those are sort of the, the one off. So you throw the sort of classic numbers. Um, so they give you a range of ABVs as well or proofs as well. Yeah. So on our exam, we had um, a 40% Buffalo Trace. Okay, because right. it was a European bottling, so oh. which is in the U.S. it's forty-five percent. So right. that went really low, as low as you can go. And then, you know, that's kind of mean. A, a <laughs> European bottling—that's that kind of. When you get into the bourbon enthusiast crowd, everyone loves cast strength whiskey. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, it's yeah. like if it's not cast strength, they're not really like hunting right. sometimes. Right. Then we went up. I think we had a yeah we had a wild turkey rare breed. Oh, okay. Which is you know fifty-eight. Yep. There's yep. change. Yep. I used to have one of those. It's gone. I drank it. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little about what was your personal, say, study life like. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for me, for me, I I, I have stacks of for this is what I do. I have stacks of cards. Let's say I got four hundred cards. I might carry with me in my pocket throughout the day ten to twenty. Wow. Yeah, just in my pocket. And so throughout the day, you're sitting on the can or at lunch. And, or you're on the phone, uh huh. Uh -huh. You know, you get the phone on, yeah, at work, and you go through it. So you, you, so throughout the day, I may have gone through them ten times. No, I'm not doing this when I'm supposed to be working. It's when you're you're in a meeting and and, and people are going wah 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 wah. wah. <laughs> Me, you know, I'm sitting in the back, you know, pulling my cards and looking at my cards. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right, great, great. You know. Yeah. So, uh, so something you put in your pocket, carry around with you. Uh, obviously, doing the videos helped. Um, writing in books, flashcards. Um, some people like to put sticky notes everywhere. <laughs> um, so, what was sort of your routine for? And then I, I would do some before I left for work. I recorded notes on audio. Wow. And listened to them on the way to work. I can only do that so much. I can't listen to myself that much. Although it's better to listen to politics. And then. When I w we get home, maybe go over a little bit more and then doing my videos. So did you have sort of a, what's your sort of routine in? Yeah, so it depends on like how close the exam was. Like once it started being like one to two months out from the exam, right. I got very, very strict about my study re uh, regiment. In that period of time, I was working on the essays before work in the morning. I would do some reading, do some note taking on that reading and just making sure like I can organize my notes so I understood them. A lot of reading of those. Um, I did some flashcards as well. I used like one of those online um, Brainscape. Just oh yeah, yeah. And so that was just like an online flashcard. That was really helpful. And then for the tastings themselves, I had a couple of different strategies. And so when I felt comfortable with all the bottlings, because there's going to be some break in time, you have to like understand what it's about. I would to to do that. You you figure out the markers that really identify the bottle for you. So you go through, take your notes, you know, do right. it, have that all organized because you are able to reference these notes on the exam, but it's so fast that you're never actually right. going to use them. You just need it. Like the organization of the knowledge and the material right. allows you to mm -hmm. like formulate like these kind of connections in your brain. So doing that. And then when I, when I would actually simulate the exam conditions, I would do a 30 minute timer, do eight, eight whiskeys blinded from the list of all the possible ones. This was closer to the exam. And then from there, I would then see which ones I missed and which ones I called about those. And then I would try to create triples and, and groupings where I would try to then say like, well, I called it this, this is what it actually was. How can I actually identify this in the future? And really kind of get zone in and hone in. So where are whiskeys that I tend to get these two mixed up? Or, or you could do wines, you know, like, so with a wine, you know, could you mix up a, uh, Pinot Noir from the Russian River versus one from Los Caneros. Or Lechik, 10-year-old, which is a peated whiskey, mm -hmm. 
versus uh, an Ardbeg 10. Now, 10 year old, 10 year old, heavily peated, heavily peated, and there's some, some very close similarities between those two. And you can get tripped up because, oh, I call this an Ardbeg 10, but it turns out it was electric 10. But you definitely should know the difference between a Laphroaig 10 and an Ardbeg 10. So, in the, did you find similarities or th these, these two bourbons from different producers could be similar, or right? Like that? Yeah, there's often similarities between the whiskeys I was comparing. For example, one of my markers for some of the brown forming products were was getting like a yeasty banana note. Okay. And so once when, when you break it down, like Jack Daniels for me is a very ripe, right. candied banana, whereas Old Forester is is not candied. It's more of this ripe right. banana. And then on the Woodford Reserve, it's a little bit more of a yeasty kind of like banana bread. Right. And so <clears throat> no, seeing these common notes, you really have to then get that double click of what is that secondary characteristic right. for me to be able to identify these two different expressions. Right. Let's talk a little bit about this whiskey because we're talking. Sure. So to me, it's not as pronounced on the nose. I'm going to not get the tingling from the previous one. Obviously, so then the ABV obviously is different in, in between these two. Aroma profile. I mean, the oak just pops on the on the other one. It's not as pronounced on this one as the oak. But obviously, the ABV is playing into that. Now, as a, so I, I have bourbons, I got shelf dedicated to bourbons, but not as a frequent bourbon um, drinker and doing comparisons, I'm not going to notice uh, the subtle differences that you would. So for you, for this whiskey, for this bourbon, what you think is distinctive about this particular bourbon? What I find distinctive about this particular bourbon is, well, one, this is a Jim Beam product, and so I do get those kind of peanutty kind of okay. notes within the whiskey. Okay. On the nose and also on the palate. Okay. I've noticed that on the Booker's, uh, mm -hmm. then that peanut character on the finish. Yeah, you get it. You get it in the palate here pretty prominently. You were you were talking about the oak. I do get a bit of oak on this one, mm -hmm. and so like if you're comparing it to like other Jim Beam products, that's really the differentiator here is that you're getting that that elevated oak. I believe this release is like 17 years or so. Wow. Wow. So you do get Which is old character. for a bourbon. It's old for a bourbon. Yeah, so yeah. It, it has that tannic structure. Right, um, right, yeah. And it's just, I think it's really well balanced. It's not yeah. like too oaky. It's not too too hot in the ABV. You kind of really have that good integration of all the different notes. It's, it's quite nice. So in terms of the oral exams, one of the, so in, in, I did a video on grain scotch whiskey production. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge I had with that one is I took, I spent three weeks just going over maybe five pages on the details of green whiskey production, which was out of a textbook, like basically a, a, a textbook, not just your normal whiskey books. And how am I going to explain this to an audience in a way that I understand and I'm confident that I know what the hell it is I'm talking about and can explain it to an audience that's never heard this before. And I kind of think if you're going to explain something to a judge, even though you're talking to someone who more than likely knows a lot more than you do, you still want to know that you know what you're talking about. And if they ask you questions, you better not just be quoting some textbook. You better really, there's, there's a different levels of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like um, you could hear the national anthem. Oh yeah, that's the uh, national anthem. Do you know the words to the national anthem? Oh, say, can you see something, 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 you know, you know, there's, there's, you, you, you recognize, there's a recognition level and they know it. And then there's someone who can know it. They know all the words, they know the history behind it and what it means. So you can, there's a different levels of, of knowledge. And with the, with the online exams, it's more recognition because it, if you're using multiple choice. You just have to recognize it out of four answers or whatever many answers there are. That's completely different than, it's not multiple choice. They're not asking you multiple choice. So you could get asked a question like, what are the different types of condensers and how do they have an impact on, 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 on a Scotch whiskey? And who uses worm tub condensers and how would you pick that up in a whiskey? They could ask a, an oral question like that, but you could also, I know in the, and from the Scotch world is, you, there's a, a space there for production notes. Hmm. What are you getting from this whiskey that is an indication of a choice they made in production? So if you had a Glen Farkless, you might pick up a note that says, oh, this is direct fire still. Uh, and there's only three distilleries that use that. 
Is there anything comparable to that, say, from on the bourbon side where you need to be able to explain a production process, and it could be in the oral exam, but also are they going to ask you production process and how it's reflected in a bourbon, or is it, they, they have that in, in, in the bourbon exams? Uh, they do. They do. There's Anything's pretty much fair game when right. it comes to whether it's the oral exam or the blind tasting. Right. We don't focus as much on the production side of it in the blind oh, okay. tasting, just because a lot right. of the whiskeys that we're using, they're all calm still whiskeys. Oh, right. Uh, so that that's that kind of like scratches out parts of that. Right. But what what comes up sometimes is the finishing. It's like right. if you do have a toasted barrel finish, or if you do okay. have like a port or a rum finish, like right. with Angel's Envy. Or maybe in the oral exam side, you can say, well, what's the differences between using a doubler or a thumper? Right. Right. And right. so then you can probably go into those distinctions. They might ask, as a master distiller, why would you choose one over the other? Right. Right. And that would be a very very good question. Right. So. And Scott, you know, shell and tube versus warm tub condenser, direct fire versus steam coil, and then how is that reflected in the whiskey? And yeah, again, like you said, you know, why would you make this choice one over the over the other? Particularly in Scott's history, history uh, you know, Dalwini, they went from uh, shell and tube to um, worm tub. No, excuse me, the other way around. They went from worm tub to shell and tube. They didn't like how it impacted the spirit, so then they went back. Hmm. So then I'm back. And so, because just it's a little slight, it's not like a major in your face, no difference. It's just a slight difference, but there was that slight difference that they wanted to have changed. So in terms of, so what I like about studying Scotch whiskey and studying production, particularly if you can get some hands-on experience, visit or at least tour distilleries, and watch videos, however you're gonna do it, that you can retro-engineer whiskey and know how it was made based on these certain characteristics. So there's a cross between smelling and tasting and then understanding production. They're not isolated. These actually affect one another. So in the notes on the blind tasting, it was just one box uh, in, the, in the grid that you could fill in production notes and how it might be reflected in, in, in the whiskey. Was is something, anything similar to that for the bourbon? Or Yeah, there was a box for that. Um, I think a lot of us didn't end up writing a lot of notes for that okay. because of the similarities in bourbon production right, across right, the distilleries. Right, right, right. Interesting, interesting. So, so, so I've been to thus far 49 distilleries in Scotland, 13 in bourbon distilleries in Texas, 13 or so in, no, six in Texas, excuse me, 13 in Texas, six in Kentucky, maybe a, a dozen or so here in California. Have you spent any time actually getting out there, being able to visit distilleries or what, in that part of your journey? Uh, yeah. So actually last October, me and a group of my, my friends, we went to Kentucky. We did like a cool. week in Kentucky. Awesome. Hit as many distilleries as we possibly could. It was a great time. Yeah, like, you know, it was it, it's bourbon mecca for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. us. Yeah, and yeah. So that was it was a good time. Cool, cool, cool. Do you find that like helps you? I just because the, the the tourist part of it, they kind of tell you the same thing. You hear the same thing, but sometimes you yeah, you have an opportunity to ask more more questions. Yes, um, and so that's where you can get more behind the scenes uh, information about a producer. Yeah, absolutely. You can ask questions. I think one of the more memorable tours that we did was Peerless, which is a craft mm -hmm. distillery. Mm -hmm. We got to, you know, stick our fingers in the, the mash tub. We yeah. got to, you know, try the distillate off the still. All of that, you know, just like ask questions like, wow, why does it taste like this? You don't get those opportunities to, to do this just yeah. sitting at home. So, yeah, so if you, next year down in Texas, if you can, in addition to Garrison Brothers, if you could visit Still Austin mm -hmm. and see their production... Uh, it's really, really, really cool. They actually have it from the tasting room. You can see the stills and stuff like that and look through the glass. But then get a behind scenes look there. That it, And they're insanely tall uh, column still. It's really, 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 really cool. So we've talked about oral exams. We've talked about some study habits. We've talked about books. Uh, we talked about a little bit about the blind tasting and so forth. Um, we talked about your, your journey and getting into bourbon. So... Where are you at now? What do you want to do now? And where do you think you want to take to take this? Um, I don't work in the industry. You don't work in the industry. This is, for me, at this stage at least, it's just an extreme habit or an obsession. So what do you think you want to do? Maybe, or maybe you're still thinking about it, what you want to do with the studies. I'm still thinking about it when it comes to how I want to be able to contribute to the bourbon industry in some way. But what I do know I'm doing is that for next year, I'm going to be sitting in the Master of Whiskey exam. Right. And so I, I do want to learn more about, you know, Scotch, Japanese, Canadian, Irish, 
um, Asian whiskeys. It, it's just, there's just so much more to learn. Cool. And there's a lot of good whiskey to drink cool. out there. Cool. The funny thing is, you know, 90% of all casks in Scotland are ex bourbon casks. <laughs> There is definitely a symbiotic relationship there. <laughs> you can't, if you're into scotch, put your nose, stick your nose up at bourbon, uh, because without uh, American bourbon cash, there would be no scotch. It, it, it wouldn't exist. You wouldn't. You have to find something else. You're gonna age it in, I don't know, plastic tubs or something. Uh, there's not enough sherry cash to go around, uh, so you, you're gonna be a little challenged to find something else to age it. Since it has to be an oak, it can't just be wood. Yeah, Ireland can use just wood. They don't have to use oak per se. So uh, definitely, if you're a fan of uh, of bourbon and bourbon cast, and then see the correlation between bourbon and, and scotch and so forth. So anyhow, uh, anything else you want to say to uh, the viewers out there? Recommendations, suggestions, motivations, so forth? If you're looking to take the exam, the Master of Bourbon exam, I'd say it was a really rewarding, really, really educational experience. It was tough. And so prepare yourself for that both mentally and just in terms of when you're making that preparation, you know, take it seriously. Right. And, I, and, you know, hats off, you know, when you see the event we had there in Scotland and despite the weather and some people didn't get their luggage from the airlines mm -hmm. and some of us got a pothole, got a, a flat tire from the pothole on the road, there were some challenges that went on there. And nevertheless, went was awesome. And you see the video there, it, the place is absolutely beautiful. And you know there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And they show little clips of the dinner that we had there, little clips there. Um, but it, it, that's, for me, that was one of the biggest highlights of the event. Um, tasting some excellent whiskeys and the camaraderie of the people there, you know, and Certainly. The, the, the jabs and the jives and the joking around. And that's because it's really about the community. Yes, the whiskey and the studies and, and all that and the beauty of Scotland or we've seen the beauty of, of Texas and the Texas whiskey industry, or if you're taking an exam in Kentucky or whatever. But it's really that uh, the ability to hang out with some fellow whiskey nerds from around the world, uh, Australia, Europe, United States, Canada, Japan, and I'm probably leaving out some countries uh, that were there. Uh, Bruce was from China, so China as well. Yeah, yeah, or, Germ or Germany. You yeah. know, They even let the Germans come in. Um, Austria, uh, <laughs> it's an inside joke. Uh, <laughs> if you were there at the dinner, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, I highly recommend it. You know, if you have the time and you think this is something you really want to do and you want to be challenged and pushed to your limit, this is sort of, it's sort of a, you know, um, a Mount Everest attempt, you know, and there's some people that don't make it to the top of Mount Everest the first time but stick with it and you keep going and keep going uh, because this is something you, you want to pursue. So, alrighty. I uh, hope you enjoyed watching this. If you have any other questions or comments or anything like that, leave them down below and we'll try to get uh, back to you uh, and answer, answer your questions. And if you're skeptical and you're like, eh, check out the website, check out the, uh, the, the YouTube channel for the Council of Whiskey Masters. There's some growing content. There's some good co content on there. You want to check that out as well. So, uh, all right, that's about it. I want to thank you for watching. And uh, until next time, uh, again, thanks for coming over too. Cheers. Hey, don't forget to subscribe and check out these other whiskey videos.